Dr. Ball received his A.D. from uh, Ball State Teachers College, his M.D. from the uh, Indiana University of Medical School, and an M.S. from the University of Minnesota. Served his internship in uh, Cook County Hospital and took specialty training in internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Ball belongs to many uh, organizations, fellowships, a couple I might mention will be the members of Phi Beta Kappa, of course the American Medical Association, the American Society of Internal Medicine, and uh, many, many other two members of the Dr. Ball has practiced in all different kinds of situations, including small things, large things, federal, general hospitals, and uh, for the past decade he's been a private practitioner of internal medicine. He has written and talked extensively, and uh, so you might be interested if he has a, an article coming out in the uh, next issue of the journal of the Indiana State Medical Association entitled Some Apparently Common Problems in Patients Receiving Contraceptive Still. Uh, when is that going to be published? I hope it's all. So uh, I'll see what that means, Dr. Philip Bunk. Of course, I didn't write that. I mean, I don't know where they got that, but I didn't write it. Um, Dr. Sinowitz called me, uh, I don't know, six months ago, I suppose, wasn't it? Probably six months ago, and in a weak moment, I told him I talked, and uh, then I sat down and thought about what I was going to talk about within the framework of what he mentioned, and uh, then I prepared my talk. And then I put it away and let it age for a while, you know, just so you can go back and find errors and mistakes or pick out the baloney, squeeze the fat out of it, the water, get rid of the bean fluid. And um, uh, then um, that, by that time, it was almost time to come here. And then I wrote him and I said, well, uh, I should have asked you what I was supposed to talk about, but I didn't. And it's too late to tell me now because I've already decided what I'm going to say. So uh, he didn't object. and. Uh, so what I have to say will be a very personalized viewpoint. Now, in order to uh, give you a chance to settle down, get used to my voice, incidentally, can you hear me all right? Yeah, okay, and get used to my accent and my language and all that. You're always supposed to start out with a funny. Well, my funnies are uh, mixed in with the subject. I wonder if I could have that first slide. You've heard a lot about quacks. I'm gonna show you a picture of one. There he is. There he is. Looks like Calvin Cooley, some people say. Well, I never knew Calvin Cooley, so I don't know. That's actually a local quack, Charles S. Coldwater, who is, uh, well, he claims he's an MD and uh, administers various quack treatments here and around the city of Muncie. You notice the shifty eyes and uh, the weak mouth and so on. <coughs> it isn't Calvin Cooley's, I can tell you that, even though it may look like it. Uh, well, anyway, uh, some of the things uh, that he did, um, um, he invented, for instance, talking about contraceptives, he invented a very stupid contraceptive device. Um, I came across this in the emergency room at our local hospital. It was a 16-year-old girl who had been brought in, hurt in a motorcycle accident, pelvic injuries, and uh, we took a test, an x-ray of her pelvis. Could we have the next slide, please, sir? And there's the uh, contraceptive device. Uh, uh, now, this was, this was a device invented by this quiet cold water. I mean, quite obviously, it's a stupid bit of uh, mechanical flim flammery. Um, and uh, it turned out that her father had locked her into this with a Yale lock. And uh, before he let her out on a date on this motorcycle, uh, but her boyfriend was a Yale graduate, so of course he knew, he knew how to open Yale lock. And uh, in fact, uh, she was six months pregnant when this film was taken. This thing. Now, if we could turn that off a minute. Um, cold water uh, has uh, also treated mental disease patients around Muncie, and. Uh, He's uh, just a con artist, that's all he is. There was one particularly infamous case where a farmer had lost his marbles, and uh, after a quack treatment, could we have that next slide, please, sir? After the next quack treatment, cold water, cold water claimed that he found his marbles in the stomach x-ray. See, of course, that's obvious baloney, it couldn't happen. Uh, he also claimed to help flat tested females. Uh, we haven't uh, been able to prove he's wrong, but uh, we're working on this. Uh, and. Um, Recently, there was a girl brought into the emergency room. Uh, she had uh, 
uh, she was a tassel dancer in a local nightclub, and uh, she had, she had uh, trained one of her tassels. And uh, so um, here she was in the emergency room again, and uh, we had to take an X-ray. I wonder if we could have that next picture, please. Sir. There's the X-ray. These are these are so-called mammograms, or breast X-rays, you see, and the tassels are still in place. Now she claimed uh, that uh, she was about a 38. She claimed that she was flat tested until a cold water seizure. Um, we've uh, studied this case intensely, and in order to try to prove something, I had a standard photograph made of this girl. And uh, could I have that now, please, sir? There it is. You can take that off now, please. That was a standard photograph of her. And uh, so uh, it appeared that cold water had actually done something here, even though he's a class. But uh, I did some research and went back to her high school annual, and we got a picture of her out of the high school annual five years before, and there she is, same way, you see. So actually, cold water hadn't done a thing. I wonder if we could turn that off now. It bothers me to have it back there. Uh, and in fact, this girl was on cold water's, um, uh, he paid her stipend to go around and say that he had uh, built this up, you see. Um, uh, well, there are many other things that Coldwater did. I think we'll dispense with some of the rest of them. We might. He, he also claimed to cure impotence. I wonder if we could have that next slide. I'll show you an impotent patient. There's the impotent patient. There's his wife. You can tell he doesn't look very good. Coldwater worked on him and claims that this is the after picture, after he uh, treated this man for impotence. Um, he can flat, flat the next one now, if you will. Uh, he doesn't even look like the same man to me, so, uh, I mean, these are, this is obviously a hokum. I mean, cold water's a quack, and, uh, we've got his number. Now, if you turn that off, please, sir. Um, should a physician concern himself at all about quackery? First, I'm going to ask myself a question. I mean, should I care? Uh, is this not a, uh, is this, uh, not a conflict of interest on, uh, the part of the physician? Uh, isn't this the physician maybe furthering his own good uh, while hacking away at his opposition? Isn't it maybe like the Buick dealer trying to uh, cut the Oldsmobile sale? Um, that is when the physician hacks at the quack. Uh, actually, I don't think it's quite the same thing because uh, the Buick and the Oldsmobile are both good cars, and the good physician or healer and the quack are presumably opposite. Uh, by your already made definition in this um, discussion, I hope, otherwise there's no point in having a conference about quackery. I hope you've defined it. I'm not going to. Uh, but it is actually, uh, there is some conflict of interest. A uh, physician could benefit uh, at the quack's discomfiture. Um, should I care at all, or should a doctor care at all, whether people go to quacks? It's a free country. Uh, should I, a practicing physician, care who gets built? Built medically, or built in the plumbing business, or built at the clothing store, or built in the real estate office? or in any way, or in bad stock sales, like uh, Aaron Space here in Muncie. Should I really care whether people go to hypnotists, or face healers, or manipulators, or device salesmen, or food fad salesmen, or vitamin colors, or patronize mail-order drug frauds, or buy LSD, or get quack books from the book dealer, or consult an astrologist, or even a palm reader? People ruin their lives with dope, and with alcohol, you can call this over booze if you want to, and by suicide, by overfeed, going too fast, and by oversmoke, too many cigarettes. Shouldn't they also be allowed to doctor themselves? That is, over-doctor themselves, or under-doctor themselves, or non-doctor themselves, or quack-doctor themselves. Um, there will always be people who will seek out a quack, even at the cost of their lives. Even if quack that's my phrase, is made the law of the land, it's being quackery prohibition. There will still be quacks, and there will probably be quack eaters. These will be like the cheap in the alcohol days. I mean, people go knock on the door, a little door open, they'll say, I want to see the quack, you know? I mean, if you uh, forbade it, I'm afraid that there would be uh, quack eaters. Uh, doctors as a group have had uh, their foolish fads. Uh, whether these could be called quackery, um, perhaps as a matter of definition. But in the past, uh, the doctor, has, the MD doctor, has been guilty of bleeding people that didn't need any bleeding. In fact, we bled people, I say we, the profession, 100 years ago, even up to 50 years ago, bled people that actually needed transfusion. Somebody came in, they were bleeding from the bowel, okay, we'll bleed them. Uh, now we'd say, that's stupid. I mean, you transfusion, you wouldn't bleed them. Then there was the laxivara. If the patient survived, uh, presumably the poisons were hurried through his body if he gave him a laxative. We gave people laxatives that had diarrhea. Today we say that's stupid, but uh, that was done. And uh, doctors had the fresh air fad bit. Uh, that wasn't so long ago. Uh, 
Uh, before isometricinic hydroxide, INH, PAS, streptomycin came out for tuberculosis. Uh, uh, the doctor had nothing except fresh air and surgery. You might say they, they'd done some collapse operations. But before the days of surgery for TB, let's go back 50 years, the doctor had nothing that was any good for tuberculosis. So we said fresh air was good for it. Uh, we put them uh, up in the mountains and uh, froze them to death or burned them up in the sun and figured that might hurt the bugs worse than hurt them. Uh, but that, uh, I'm sure, accomplished nothing. Then we went through some diet fads. Uh, you had to, the adult was supposed to drink one or two quarts of milk a day, eat a whole cube of butter and six eggs. Well, then we decided that maybe milk, butter, and eggs would poison you. That causes your cholesterol to go up and your triglycerides, and you really shouldn't do that. And uh, what are our fads of today in medicine that might be called even uh, the... Um, somewhat quacky in the future. It's an interesting thing to think about. Maybe this mass tranquilizer prescription business will be called quackery in the future of the standard MD. Maybe the contraceptive pill will be considered to be a quacky era in the future. Um, actually, I long for the good old pioneer days uh, when you could say, I don't give a damn what my neighbor does. This is also the phrase caveat emptor, meaning let the buyer beware, let people get what they want. If it's bad, tough toenail, it's their life, it's their money, they piled up. But the complexities of life in our interdependent status in this world today mean that all citizens cannot always know much about what's good plumbing, what's good wiring, what's good road building material. And uh, hence sometimes have to have some advice or education or steering, whatever you want to call it. Of course, this type of paternalism or control is inescapable for those that we say are not responsible, like psychotics and like mentally defective and like seniles and like children. They can't be expected to be responsible for themselves. So by applying what you call the good neighbor concept, we have to protect them against fraud by quackery. And uh, there's one place that I think government or somebody has to uh, carry out some advice. And of course, if you let an incompetent quack treat uh, totally without restriction, one who really didn't know much about what he was doing, or maybe he knew it, but was going to treat anyway. That is either an intentional or unintentional quack. Uh, if he treated tuberculosis and meningitis, he could actually let epidemics loose. So you and I would be concerned about that. Uh, I would, and you would. Uh, also, uh, we're concerned uh, by this so-called neighbor concept uh, that uh, we don't let people drink unlimited amounts of booze and then drive. Although we'll let them drink unlimited, amount, unlimited amounts of booze until they die as long as they don't bother anybody in the process. I mean, uh, uh, so there are some things that we're in, uh, we have uh, social considerations and laws about. Also, we permit people to kill themselves with cigarettes by getting up the steam and dying, but we give them a little warning in the process, danger this may be harmful to you, it says on the package. Um, uh, but I think that we the people and we the voters uh, must protect us the consumers against our own ignorance or advise us, in the case of our own agents, about all the avenues of medical treatment. I think there's a place for that. I would hope that this would be chiefly a voluntary, sort of a better business bureau type of thing, or an open public forum type of advice, like here, or like in school. Uh, but I'm sure it's inescapable that we, the people, as the federal government, become more and more involved in protecting the individual, that is us. Uh, how much uh, advisory power should the EMA have in uh, telling uh, uh, people, uh, the public, uh, the federal government, what constitutes good medical practice? <clears throat> Not doctors, with the EMA. Here we must recognize that the EMA has been somewhat fallible in the past. Uh, the EMA at one time was four square against uh, hospital insurance. Now it considers hospital insurance to be the mainstay against socialism. Uh, the EMA has also been against group practice, just to give you a couple of examples, so that the EMA is not completely infallible on subjects that have to do with the practice of medicine. Um, should the EMA uh, foster development of a, whole, of a real medical competitor, a wholesale, a wholesome medical competitor? In other words, an actually good competitor, should we doctors, should the EMA, should the people uh, foster an actual competitive type of medicine to compete with EMD? That's an interesting question. Isn't monopoly always bad? Uh, isn't competition always good? Uh, that's uh, the capitalistic system. You don't just have one car you can buy, like maybe it used to be true in Russia, you got a choice. Uh, does the present government restrictive licensing of who can doctor 
and they have restrictive licenses about who can doctor. Uh, some cases not so restrictive, but at least some restriction. Doesn't this prevent wholesome competition and foster the squeezing of other trends of medical thought into quack fields? For instance, a man can't, uh, he can't get an unlimited license to treat people unless he goes into the MD field now, in this case. So, if he really has some other ideas uh, about treatment, does this force him to go into quack fields or into quack avenues? Um, interesting consideration. Uh, for instance, uh, about cancer, if you had talked to an MD uh, 25 years ago and said, uh, what's good for cancer, he'd have said radical surgery or x-ray, nothing else. Uh, and he, if you had said, well, what about these shots? What about these uh, drugs I hear about? It's all quiet. I mean, he wouldn't have said anything else, just that. Because at that time it was, but it isn't now. In other words, at that time, the formal, the standard MD considered the idea even that you could have a drug that would treat cancer to be ridiculous. But now we have such. They may not cure. They uh, sometimes approach the cure in their control uh, that will uh, permit the patient to live even decades. Uh, also, at one time, uh, if you'd mentioned cancer treatments to the standard MD, you would have said ridiculous, like sheer quackers. And yet now the MD has such. That apparently, uh, in initial studies on uh, skin cancer are very effective. Uh, it being a trade union, and that's what our AMA is, it should be careful not to act like a trade union. And for instance, one example of uh, the way trade unions have acted, take uh, prefabricated houses. When they first came out, the standard carpenter, the standard house builder said, that's terrible, that's ridiculous, that's illegal, that's, un that's dishonest, that's un-American. It shouldn't happen. But it has happened, and it's increased, not decreased. And the standard carpenter, the standard house builder, has had to uh, recognize that uh, there's another way to put up a house besides stall each individual board and pound each individual nail. Well, it may be that there is a place for some automated, prefabricated, uh, computerized, uh, program, practice of medicine in the future. Maybe that's only 10 years away. And so uh, the AMA being a trade union that has a near monopoly, uh, by government licensing near monopoly, must be very careful not to be uh, uh, simply holding back progress in the guise of stamping out uh, oppositional clackers, so-called. Uh, anyway, uh, these are some questions that I ask myself as a doctor. In other words, uh, what, is the, what is the place of government in this? What is the place of education in this? What is the place of uh, the EMA in this and the private position? And uh, how much uh, control should be exerted? Uh, but now we get another factor in the last few years, and that is that tax money is heavily involved in the medical care of the citizenry. I, as citizen, now forget for a five minute that I'm an MD, I become vitally concerned uh, that my tax money not be wasted on payments for faulty or quacky medical care. In other words, before the days of the medical, uh, of the uh, government participating in the field of medicine, I could have this viewpoint that I really don't care, or that I do care, but in a sort of a mildly advisory or paternalistic way. But now I'm now it's uh, my tax money, and my government getting my tax money, and I don't want them to blow it on quack tests. Obviously, with the federal government increasingly participating in medical insurance, called Medicare or whatever, the government has to become involved in the determination of what constitutes quack medicine. This is no different than the fact that the government, when they build an interstate highway system, have to state what's good concrete, what's a good bridge, what's a good fence, uh, what's a good light. Uh, they have to decide that. Otherwise, I'm sure there would be some contractors that would put a road out here that would fall apart in a couple of years. Uh, now, assuming that the doctor may want to do something about medical quackery, education of the public, and that he isn't assuming that he does, I'm not sure I am, and assuming that he isn't totally prejudiced in a conflict of interest in doing so, what can the doctor do? I'm not sure that either of those are positive in my case, but I point them out. It is my belief that the best thing a doctor can do is to show by his example what a good physician or healer is. I can really do no better than quote sections one, two, and three of the principles of medical ethics of the AMA, and I have a copy of that, or several copies, as you want. And this is in the AMA principles of ethics. The principal objective of the medical profession is to render service to humanity with full respect for the dignity of man. Physicians should merit the confidence of patients entrusted to their care, rendering to each a full measure of service and devotion. Physicians should strive continually to improve medical knowledge and skill and should make available to their patients and colleagues the benefits of their professional attention. 
Physicians should practice a method of healing founded on a scientific basis, and he should not voluntarily associate professionally with anyone who violates this principle. Um, there are some particulars that I think a physician, uh, that I feel where a physician can do the most to serve as a good example to his patients and what is good medicine, and uh, explain the best to his patients uh, what is good medicine so that they can avoid quackering, quack medicine. Uh, I think a doctor should practice as nearly as possible in unhurried fashion, and appearing to have enough time to listen, and practice the art of convincing his patients of the common sense for diagnosis and the treatment of a problem that is at hand. If a doctor is too busy to explain, too busy to appear interested, too busy to listen, too busy to be convincing, uh, that patient may be dissatisfied and the next stop is uh, somebody who is less expert. He should be especially careful in the handling of the incurable cancer patient, being honest but not devastating or destructive of the dignity of that patient, never failing to lend comfort to that patient who may be in, a, in the process of dying. Uh, the cancer patient uh, is particularly vulnerable to grasping for straws, uh, going any place, spending any amount of money to get something done, anything. Uh, the doctor should also discuss situations of uh, treatment with the shopper type of patient, which is a type of a minor neurosis, a patient that likes to try here and try there and see what this doctor will bid or do or bid or do and so on or who simply likes to be treated for fun. It's sort of something to do on a rainy afternoon. Um, the doctor should also be careful in handling and reassuring the anxiety person that has many somatic or body complaints so that they don't pursue each little body he can change to another practitioner, perhaps an unscrupulous one. In other words, you've got to stop and explain to patients why sometimes their body can play tricks on them and not just say to them, it's in your head, forget about it, which never works. Uh, the uh, doctor should also um, reassure or recognize the grasper for straws, the patient that's always looking for a miracle cure for a disease that doesn't have this. Uh, the patient with rheumatoid arthritis that's had it 10 years and wants to get rid of it now, but there isn't any such thing to get rid of it now. Uh, and the doctor should explain medical facts to the medically uninformed. Uh, a patient comes in that's having an ulcer, first time, they never had an ulcer before, they don't know anybody that has an ulcer, they don't understand ulcer. If you tell them that's a hole in their stomach, that worries them, they, they don't really see how you can treat a hole in the stomach with pills. Uh, so you have to stop and explain properly the ups and downs and ins and outs of diseases so that uh, the patient won't next ask somebody in the parking lot at the factory who will have a ready quack cure that they can get someplace. Uh, also, the doctor should keep an adequate supply of pamphlets, um, not about quackery, but explaining disease, like um, explaining heart disease, diabetes, emphysema, rheumatoid arthritis. In other words, he should have information that is from good sources that will help explain medical facts so that the patient will better understand the problem and not be as likely to go someplace else seeking uh, impossible help. Uh, sometimes, too, that means the physician should put the patient on the track of uh, societies that they can join, like the diabetic can join the uh, um, American Diabetes Association uh, uh, for patients. Uh, the uh, diabetic can take the uh, Diabetic uh, Monthly News Magazine and uh, understand more about their disease. <coughs> um, then we should be particularly, we physicians, kind and careful and tactful in handling uh, the degenerative problems of the increasingly large population of old people uh, who, uh, as they come apart at the seams with heart disease and degenerative disease of the brain and uh, degenerative disease of the kidneys and the extremities and all the rest of the ailments of age, uh, sometimes they, looking for the fountain of youth, will pursue the fountain of youth into some sideways that simply get them more trouble, not less. I mean, after all, old age is old age, degenerative disease is degenerative disease, and some of these things uh, are not uh, correctable. And sometimes you have to very gently, kindly uh, explain that to people who are looking for a cure for something that, as far as we know, has no cure. Uh, and of course, um, an important thing that we doctors should do as a group in protecting the public against the medical class is an adequate supply of good medical service. Now that's a sore point right now because 
uh, whether uh, many of you know it or not, at your uh, young, useful years of good health, uh, there is a doctor shortage. Doctors are spread too thin and sometimes do a poor, inadequate, or hurried job. Uh, and hence, uh, they uh, will, uh, there are, I think, a larger percentage of dissatisfied patients in a situation where there is an inadequate supply of physicians. Um, that gets into the subject, if you want, of uh, whether Ball State should have a medical school. I personally think it should, and um, I think that uh, the time is now. Um, of course, other ways uh, in which the patient can educate the public is that of serving on community, community medical organizational boards that contact the public, like Cancer Society, Diabetes Association, Heart Association, and so on. These are valuable places for the physician to serve, and I'm afraid are being less and less served by the doctor because of his time shortage. Um, but also because of some medical men's political prejudice. Unfortunately, uh, doctors have prejudices. You may read about them occasionally. And uh, some medical men have uh, developed a rather antagonistic attitude toward participating in any public or private medical health discussion because they feel that this uh, group will try to take the ball away from them, which they have, and uh, therefore they don't want to participate. Um, one of the most important responsibilities of the doctor, uh, also in the quack business, is that of exposing and harpooning the gray fringes of practice in his own profession. Uh, the doctor should um, should be alert to this. Unfortunately, I'm afraid doctors in the past haven't done too good a job at doing anything about this. But the doctor should also explain his refusal to his patients when he refuses to use some treatment that, uh, uh, that he uh, thinks is not good or necessary. For instance, if the doctor is asked to give penicillin for a cold and he doesn't think penicillin is a treatment for a cold, he should have the guts to say so and not carry that out. If a patient that the doctor thinks doesn't need uh, diet pills, insists on diet pills, and the doctor is against that for one reason or another, then he should have the guts to explain why not and refuse them. And if the doctor thinks that uh, here is a woman that doesn't need a hysterectomy and uh, he's got uh, good reasons for saying so and the woman just says maybe she's tired of her periods or maybe she's tired of buying pads or maybe she's tired of contraceptives or maybe she's tired of a little monthly pain, uh, that's not good enough. He should explain his reasons and not be led into an easy course of action at the moment. Um, of course, by medical ethics, we are supposed to expose quacks in our own profession. Again, I'll quote from Medical Ethics. The medical profession should safeguard the public and itself against physicians deficient in moral character or professional competence. Physicians should observe all laws, uphold the dignity and honor the profession, and accept its self-imposed discipline. They should expose without hesitation illegal or unethical conduct of fellow members of the profession. Uh, unfortunately, there have been times that we've been deficient as a group in doing this. We've permitted sometimes abortionists, the miracle diet plan specialists, uh, perpetrators of unnecessary surgery, and other such people to uh, practice in and among us without doing anything about it for one reason or another. Uh, in this regard, however, I must say I think the modern hospital that is insurance supported and is screened by all kinds of boards and committees both inside and outside its walls, uh, has done a major job in helping to clean up medicine's own camp in terms of irregular practice uh, you know, of this type and thereby improve the standard of medical practice. Used to be doctors practiced chiefly in one little space they call their office or on a house call, and now they practice more and more in the hospital where their treatments and their techniques are scrutinized by others. This is good. Well, uh, I'm going to finish with some questions. Um, should, the physician, should the citizen be merely protected by private groups or public bodies against bad medical care? Or should he be allowed or guaranteed good medical care? Or should he be allowed no medical care if he wishes? Or should he be allowed queer or quack medical care if he wishes? Or should he be ordered to get good medical care because it's the government's rule? These are not easy questions to answer, and in some cases, I think, would infringe on religious beliefs, like Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian scientists. In some cases, it might involve an actual dictatorial prejudice policing by the government. They might be wrong. They might be right. 
It might involve restriction of the rights of the individual to life, liberty, and fouling up as he chooses, as long as he doesn't foul somebody else up in the process. These are some ideas of mine, and uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I hope I may have stimulated some thought along these philosophic lines. Thank you.